Welcome everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is Henrik Hulgard, and as you can see, I've been doing configuration for quite a number of years now, and actually configured is very close to becoming a 20-year-old company. So uh, we have had uh, a number of very interesting projects over the years, and uh, today um, I'm going to talk about end-to-end -end, uh, configuration, and uh, you could say. The key areas where Configit is uh, engaging with our customers is uh, is around managing product variants, um, writing rules, defining the variability of products, optimizing uh, that variability, and um, and helping organizations um, in 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 that area. And and very closely related to that, of course, is to uh, to uh, make sure that that information is aligned across uh, various systems. And uh, uh, whether that is uh, from PLM, CRM, ERP, legacy systems, and uh, how to to uh, to do that. And today, that's what I'm going to spend uh, 20 minutes, approximately, on on trying to explain very shortly. Uh, please ask questions. Uh, if you ask them as I go along, I, I can try to address them uh, during my presentation. Otherwise, we'll take them in the end. Um, so. Um, what is this uh, webinar going to be about? Well, it's going to be about end-to-end -end configuration. So basically, I'm going to first explain what I mean by that. Um, next, a little bit about how to achieve that. And then in the end, uh, a little bit about some of the benefits that organizations get uh, when they manage to implement such a solution. Um, so what does end-to-end -end configuration mean? Uh, the way we see the world, it, it means that it, it's, it's the product life cycle from a product gets engineered, designed in the very early phases, all the way through the engineering phases, through the sales phases where the product gets configured, priced and sold, to the manufacturing phases where it gets manufactured, of course, delivered, deployed, and in the end to the uh, say, uh, servicing areas where it uh, gets serviced, it gets upgraded, and in the end it gets decommissioned and may have to be replaced with a equivalent product uh, based on, the, on, on, on some of the same requirements as, as the original one. So that that's sort of the end that we, the two ends that we're talking about. It is from early design all the way through uh, the decommissioning of the product. You could say. So the challenges that uh, organizations face and, and those that we are trying to address with such a solution is that it's important that they have a consistent view um, of that product offering. And consistent view means that the, the understanding of the variability that engineering has has to be consistent and aligned with the understanding of the variability that sales has, for example. That, that is the one of the classical misalignments that the view that engineering has is different from the view that sales has, and that means that sales uh, sells stuff that cannot be manufactured in the end. Um, it's also important that when you go, for example, come to the service area, which is increasingly becoming important for many organizations, that when you service a product, that you have a up-to-date understanding on how a particular uh, product was configured uh, when you're going to service it. You may want to do an actual service replacing parts. You might also have to upgrade that product to add new capabilities to it. And, and those operations require that you have detailed knowledge on, on, on how that product is in that installed base. The other challenge that we see is, is that of change. And how do you reflect a change across these different functions? And these changes, they can come in different areas, but but it might be an engineering change, might be a legal requirement, might be different types of change that influences the configurations and the, the variability of the product. And naturally, that change has to be reflected across these different functions. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a, a very uh, simple yet a dramatic example of such a change, and, and this comes from, from one of our uh, uh, customers, uh, JLR. Uh, some years ago, there was a tsunami in Japan, and it actually destroyed uh, a factory that was manufacturing uh, the particular paint color that uh, was this particular orange paint. 
I believe. I don't know if it was exactly this color, but uh, you can imagine that that there's this uh, unforeseen event happening that that means that suddenly you cannot sell a particular feature. Uh, you have to stop that order intake at some point. And how do you manage that change throughout the organization in an efficient manner? It, it's no good if that such a change, change takes three months to, to propagate uh, throughout the organization. And then you start getting all these orders in that you cannot manufacture because you don't have the pink color. So that's an example, I'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes, of, of, of what does it mean to have aligned and consistent information uh, throughout the organization. So in this case, uh, you can certainly imagine that uh, the challenge would be that uh, there are many different sales configurators out there. They uh, are different, the ones, uh, the, the websites might be different from the ones that uh, dealers or resellers are using. They have their own systems and uh, they might even be different from the ones that manufacturing have. So if this is the case, it's very difficult and, and time consuming to have to, to update all these different systems with this little piece of information that you shouldn't sell this particular paint color in a, in a time frame. So end-to-end -end means consistent views and the changes are propagated smoothly and efficiently. So how do we achieve this? Um, this is, uh, of course, not a simple thing. Uh, I have tried to, to uh, list here the three things that, that we are typically working with when we have uh, customers that would like to go this down, down this direction. Uh, the first step is to make sure that you have a consistent language across the organization. The other one, I'll talk, and I'll talk more about each of these uh, shortly. Um, then the second one is how do you separate the physical uh, representation of a product from a more logical one? And the third item that you have to have in place is to have uh, the systems being uh, well integrated. So if you look at the first one, um, uh, we call that having a, a global feature dictionary. Uh, what this means is that uh, you standardize on uh, what codes you use to describe the product variants. Um, in many organizations, they think of product variants in terms of parts, uh, in terms of uh, you can combine this part with that part and, and, uh, and build up a system that way. Uh, that's not the, how we, uh, that, that's not sort of a best practice if, if you really want to be good at handling your variants. You have to abstract that up into, into features, into more abstract capabilities. And, and for example, a pink color. Uh, for a car um, certainly is a more abstract concept than the individual parts. You can imagine that that the, the, that cho that choice in paint color will drive many different parts, uh, both the the bumpers and the paint actually being put on the on the car and the handles maybe and the side mirrors and that there will be many parts that gets influenced by by a, a different choice of paint color. So. The, the feature is is the paint color. It's the the sports pack. It's the uh, it's the capability that the product offers. It's not uh, a selection of parts. So having a standardized way to uh, to uh, talk about these features will be quite essential, and it has to be standardized uh, across different products and also across the organization. So uh, for example, I've put on here you should only have one code for a particular voltage. If you happen to be a company that deals with electrical products and components, then don't invent different codes for the same thing. Uh, that makes it very, very difficult to, for example, combine two products into one or communicate across the organization. These feature codes, they, they are uh, gonna be the key in linking the different functional areas of, of the organization. So, it's not going to be the part numbers and the, the bill of materials that's going to be key. It's going to be the, the what we call the feature string or the configuration of the product. And, and, and that's the DNA of, of, of how the product is. Uh, here on the screen on the right, I have showed a, a picture of a, a little piece of paper that was in, in, in a car I used to own. Uh, it, it happens to be an Audi, but it, the, the whole point is that if you look at this piece of paper, all those little codes uh, at the bottom half, 
those are the feature codes. And if I gave this piece of paper to an engineer at Audi, he would be able to tell exactly what parts was in my car and what features and what capabilities, what color it had, whether I had the sports seats or the normal seats and all that. So, so that's the key uh, communication that you need to have when you are communicating uh, across the different aspects of the organization. And, and as illustrated on the bottom here, you, you can derive a number of different informations based on that feature string. You can derive build, different types of build materials, maybe a product code, maybe the printed documentation can be derived, maybe a, a, a 3D CAD visualization can be derived. Uh, you, can, you can derive a lot of information if you have this. So getting this in place, that would be step number one in achieving a, an end-to-end -end, uh, configuration solution. The next step would be to separate, and I already mentioned this a little bit, uh, separate the logical concepts of the variability of the product from the physical one. And when I say physical, I mean the part numbers, the, the actual bill of material uh, that's going to represent the, the physical parts that's going to go into the product. If you, if you manage to separate that up into a, a more logical world in, a, in what we call a product model, then you can use that product model uh, as a communication tool, again, across the different functional areas. You can use it to analyze uh, the variability of the product. You can optimize it. You can combine that model with different statistical uh, information to get information about parts that are very rarely used. And thereby, you can, by adding additional rules, you can eliminate parts uh, that are uh, costly and, and not being used in very many configurations anyway. Um, these uh, product models, they, they uh, sit here in the middle and, and that's a key element that the, the models and the rules, they are spanning these different functional areas. So the feature string is what comes out of uh, this area of what we call modeling. Uh, that's where you define the features, that's where you define the rules that dictates the relationship between the different features in the model. Uh, and in that model uh, comes rules that some of them will come from engineering, uh, technical rules, legal rules. They define uh, aspect of the product that has to be satisfied from an engineering perspective. But there also are rules that come from other parts of the organization, most notably from, from the uh, sales and marketing area. They deal with how the product is positioned in the market, what is a standard uh, feature in Denmark versus Sweden versus the UK. Um, they deal with packaging uh, the different features, making it easier for customers to, to configure the product. They also deal with guided selling and, and mapping from high level requirements down to the technical, more technical features. Uh, an example could be if I would like to have a car that's uh, environmentally friendly or uh, is very comfortable. Um, those could be examples of things that from a commercial perspective makes sense, but then there has, has to be a mapping down to the more technical elements of the product. So all of these different rules, some of which can come from servicing and some of which can come from manufacturing as well, uh, all of them are going into this centralized model that becomes the, the heart of, of a solution. Now, the third item on the list was uh, system architecture. Um, that, that's a little bit, uh, I don't know, high co general uh, concept, but, but it deals with how you make sure that these uh, different systems that are in place in a large organization, how do they get this aligned view on the variability of the products? And the three key systems that we normally deal with is the PLM system, that's where engineering is done, CAT work, bill of material definitions, the CRM system, that's the commercial uh, world where uh, opportunities and accounts and, and quotes and, uh, and, and, and that type of thing is, is living, and the ERP system, which is in the manufacturing world where the, the, each individual order gets uh, executed and manufactured, and of course the ERP system will need to know about the configurations as well. So the whole uh, key to achieve alignment is to make sure that all of these systems are all um, sharing the same source of truth with respect to configuration. What I, what you sort of could see in the previous uh, slide was or that, that each of these systems already typically have some kind of configuration capability. It's just not very good 
and it only covers the aspect of the world that that system uh, represents. So typically in the PLM system, you won't find the commercial uh, rules, you only find the engineering rules, you won't find the, the, um, the these more uh, market-oriented rules. So by putting all the rules in one system and then integrating from these enterprise systems to a centralized configuration engine, that would be key to making sure that, that these systems get an aligned view. Now, how do you do this in practice? And I'm not claiming this is like uh, very simple and we just do install next, next. There, there's quite a bit of work involved in this. Um, this picture tries to illustrate still very abstract, but a little bit more, um, you could say, uh, technical. We have the configuration management system here in green. That's where you do the features and the rules. Um, they get defined, uh, both the engineering rules and the market uh, rules. Once you have them, you can expose a, a configurator or a, a services exposing the configuration logic. The information about what features are available gets used when you define uh, what's called the super bomb, which is a also sometimes called 150% bomb. Those uh, bill of materials get defined in the PLM system, but they need to know uh, some context around what are the features I can use in, in a certain product uh, because they need to be able to define these uh, these super bombs and they will have to write expressions referring to the features that selects the parts depending on what features has been selected in the uh, in the configuration process. From the engineering bomb you derive a, an M bomb uh, and then those gets typically synchronized to a, an ERP system and the whole picture comes together because uh, the uh, CRM system in the lower left corner will use the configurator to configure a product, create a configuration. Once it has created that configuration, it can submit that. When the customer accepts the order, it can submit that to the ERP system. It will say, please, there's an order for this product with this configuration. And with that information combined with the super bomb, it can create a, a order specific bill material and it can it can process that as, as a normal order uh, throughout the, the procurement and, and manufacturing delivery processes that, that gets done by, by the ERP system. So you can see there are some, some key elements in this and there are two key processes being as, uh, done here. One is of course the, the product definition process where you create the, the product and define it and push that to the ERP system. And then there's the order to delivery or order to cash or, or what else people call this, but basically the transactional, transactional world where customers order products and they configure them and they order them and they manufacture them. Now, if you have such a system, and if we go back to the example with, the, with our tsunami, um, how would you then do this change? How would that work? Well, it's actually quite simple if you have an enterprise end-to-end -end configuration solution in place because all you have to do is to create a rule and it might look as simple as this. I'm, in practice, it will have more information about when it, this rule applies, uh, when it starts and stops and things like that. But, but basically we're saying uh, we're not going to offer the color called orange any longer. Uh, we put that in our modeling. We test it. We approve it, release it, and the moment we release it, that change will be immediately uh, reflected across the different functional areas. And when I go on the website, I will no longer see this value because the, the website will use the configuration service that comes out of the centralized uh, configurator. Uh, the engineers will know about it, everybody will know about it. So to make this even a little bit more concrete, I, I have a couple of slides from one of our customers, which is ABB. And ABB is, uh, uh, have been a customer of Configure for many years, and we are uh, rolling out configuration solutions in many parts of the organization. Uh, this particular picture I'm going to show on the next slide comes from a, a low, low voltage circuit breakers uh, division, and um, they have worked with us for, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Um, and, um, and you can say their products are, are looks fairly simple. There are circuit breakers as you might find them in, in your house or other places. Um, and uh, But they're each configurable and they also uh, get included in, in systems. There are system builders that need to build up entire uh, 
sort of racks with equipment in it and these are components that will go inside that those racks and and the way this looks like uh, at ABB and of course this will be different from from customer to customer but uh, the way this looks is is uh, not exactly like this uh, abstract picture on the left but but still it's um, it's not that far off we have in the top left corner the configuration system they use configured ace from us uh, that's where they define features and families. They define the rules. They define the um, both engineering and, and commercial rules. They have change management that is aligned with their PLM system. They have PDC windchill. Um, there is a, a process that makes sure that changes in one system is aligned with changes in the other one. They have a, a bill of material integration uh, between the PLM and our A system. So that's basically this arrow going on on the on the on the top there. Once uh, the rules have been uh, tested, they have been approved, they, they get released. And once they get released, they get used in two different scenarios. They get used um, from within their SAP ERP system. The ERP system will also need to have the, the, the features and families they call characteristics and values in SAP. They have the bill of materials, uh, as I mentioned. They are the ones that do the so-called bomb solve, where they combine the configuration with the super bomb to get the order specific bomb um, and they have uh, since the configurator in sap needs to know about the rules there is this punch out where it, it basically calls out of sap system and use a configuration service to make sure that the configuration is is correct if you do it within the sap system and they need to do that sometimes if customers would like to change uh, uh, an existing order that has been placed they also have a, a configured quote system, a CPQ system that's integrated to their CRM system. And that quoting system, of course, also uses the, the models that come out of, of the configuration engine. And, and then on the, the details on the lower right-hand side is, is that they have multiple ERP systems and, and many details that I will not cover. But it's just to say, this is how it looks like in a real world. Um, there are, uh, of course, lots of details, but this it indicates some of the key data entities that are uh, present in the different systems. And there are uh, work to be done in order to make sure that these systems that will have copies of information, that that is kept aligned and consistent. And that's done typically through web services. So uh, a little bit about the... Um, the um, Benefits that APB have seen, they, uh, they, this is an APB slide that I just have copied in and, and they have uh, measured themselves uh, a drastic reduction in the time to market. They have experienced no errors in the manufacturing orders, which is a, a drastic change for them. And they have improved, uh, and I don't know how they measured that, but they indicated that they have improved the co collaboration between engineering and sales and marketing. So, that is some of the benefits that you can expect to see if you implement an end-to-end -end configuration solution. You, you will find that in the engineering space, it's mostly about time to market. It's about optimizing the variability. It's about um, basically being more efficient, uh, not engineer stuff that is, is not gonna be able to be sold later. Um, in sales, it's more uh, reducing errors, uh, making sure that what gets quoted is accurate. Um, it's also about reducing the time uh, to close a deal because the information you provide to the customer is accurate and you don't have uh, to reiterate and go back to engineering to, to check stuff. You can trust the configurator. You know you have uh, current, up-to-date and accurate information. In the manufacturing side of things, it's, it's very much about uh, reducing errors and making sure that you don't stop production because of misbuilds. Um, and in the service area, there's, a, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's a number of areas where you need accurate information about how the product is being configured. When you send out a service technician, he needs to know exactly what are the capabilities I can expect on the particular uh, product that it's going to be serviced. We also see configuration knowledge being used uh, quite heavily in situations where you would like to offer upgrades to an existing product. And of course, you need to know how that has been configured. Uh, and we see this uh, very much in, in the industrial machinery area, but also in, in automotive these days that, that um, when a new feature is, is, is brought to market, 
why don't we try to to offer that to existing customers in in, in cars that are all already on the road but in order to do that you have to be very sure that it actually will work uh, and for for doing that you need to have very good understanding of of the configuration okay uh, so that was basically it. This is a, a little bit quick tour uh, uh, where where we go quickly through this. But um, I hope to tell, uh, have explained that uh, the key elements of, of doing this, uh, the way I see it at least, is that you have to establish a common language across the organization that's being used across all the products. Um, you have to centralize all the rules uh, they may not be centralized in the authoring we have quite a number of customers that for example have uh, a, a, some rules get authored in one place uh, but they all get brought together in in a single rule engine so for example you, you we have examples where, where engineering rules come sits in the plm system but we pull them into our configuration offering the ace application and then we add the sales and marketing rules on top of that and then that together forms this uh, single source of truth. But the engineers will still maintain the rules in the PLM system. That, that's quite okay, um, but, but it's important that everybody has the same view on the rules. And that means they have to have a single point where they can query and say, what is a valid com configuration? And then um, the last part, of course, is that these different applications have to be, uh, they have to be integrated. They have to be talking. Um, to that centralized rule engine. There's one question, if you have consistent view between PLM, CRM, and ERP, how do you deal with lifecycle changes over time? Uh, we offer something three months out, but we build something different technically by the time we manufacture or deliver. Um, so there, there definitely are uh, lifecycle changes that needs to be dealt with. And our configuration engine have uh, one lifecycle is, is basically effectivity, that there's a time aspect that you can uh, put features in that you don't put in tomorrow, but you put them in uh, three months uh, out and you use the time effectively to, to control that. There's also life cycle in, in the versioning of these models that, that you, there are changes. Um, you, you, um, you may change something and you might have created a quote on the old version of the, of the rules and that quote will have to be updated with the more recent version of the, of the rules. So definitely those have to be dealt with. So what about software, which gives a huge variant? Yeah, so software is increasingly becoming a, a challenge, uh, definitely. And uh, primarily, I think the challenge is that uh, a lot of traditional manufacturing companies uh, are not software companies, they are manufacturing companies. So so the, the fact that they have to deal with, with software, which is being versioned uh, very differently from from parts and, and, and other artifacts that, that are normally done in the engineering world, um, and getting that to align, that, that definitely is a challenge. The, the way we deal with software is that we, we also create configuration models for software. So those parameters that goes into the software, they, that gets modeled as part of the configuration model. Um, so this could be that you have a climate control unit and it has a piece of software and it needs to know certain aspects of, of a car. Um, that, those parameters that it needs to know, they get put inside the configuration model as features along all the other features. So there are many features in these models. Uh, some of them are relevant for some people and not others, and that's perfectly fine. As long as they go in the same model, because then you get the combined effect of all the rules. Another question is, are interfaces to software tools like Vector CDM available? Uh, I think I can answer that definitively because I don't know Vector CDM. Uh, so there's no standard interface for that. And, and maybe I should say that um, we, we offer some standard web services. They are well documented, they are sample codes, they are, they are, they are well established, they're fully generic, meaning they're not, they don't have concepts that are specific to any one organization. Uh, then we have uh, partners, either we can do that or uh, our partners like Infosys, they build then the integrations between our services and whatever, um, enterprise systems are out there. We have some standard integrations. We have done a lot with PC Windchill. We have done a lot with SAP so, and Salesforce. So those we're very familiar with, but there are many systems out there and there are many legacy systems as well. And 
one of the challenges, of course, is that these legacy systems, you cannot just get rid of them. You have to keep them around. So you still have to provide the data needed for them to, to do their thing. So there's a lot of work and, and, and to, to take data out of this centralized uh, application that we provide and then provide data to these different systems so that they can they don't realize that there's a different uh, authoring environment in place. Uh, they see the rules and features in the way that they have all, always seen them. Uh, is there a standard language for feature modeling models available? Yes, uh, I don't know what it's meant by standard, um, uh, but uh, yes, there is, we have a standard language for expressing these logical models. And, and when, when I say it's a standard, it means it's used throughout configured. Uh, and we are actually thinking of how to turn that into a, a real standard. Uh, uh, we'll soon make that publicly available and uh, we are pursuing uh, how to, to, to sort of uh, embrace that in, in a more uh, ESO kind of uh, standard uh, standardization process. But the language is, uh, is, is uh, almost like a programming language and, and it's very simple actually. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the question was open ESO. So, so it, it's, it's not as far yet, but, but uh, that's the direction we're taking it because it, it, there's already some standards. There's one called AP242 and, and it's uh, used in automotive to share uh, these configuration models, but it's not very accessible uh, generally. It's very complex and uh, it's very specific uh, to automotive, I would say. All right, uh, so that was all we have time for uh, now. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, if you uh, want more information, we have a website, of course. Uh, you're also free to contact me, write to me, or you can give, uh, contact our uh, sales organization directly by, by writing to this info at config.com.